The second story uh, I call, um, what do I call it? <laughs> <laughs> I call it guilt and the time machine. Adi had just turned 16. And he had been doing some work for his dad lately. And so his dad allowed him to use the car. His 1956 hard top convertible. God, 16. Chuck Berry on the radio, full blast, singing Sweet Little Sixty. Some friends in the car, windows rolled down, sleeves rolled up. <laughs> Before he knew the word cool, he felt cool, Artie did. And his friend Dan was coming down the other way. And he rolled down his windows. And they could barely hear each other because they both had the radio blasting at Chuck Berry. Where are you going, Artie said to Dan. I don't know. We're probably going to go out to Quincy and get some fried clams. And then maybe we'll go to the track. Where are you going, Artie? We're going to Newton. I don't think you know Steve. He just moved there just before you moved into the area. But he's out there and he goes to a co-ed high school and he's got some girlfriends and he invited us to a party. Good luck, party. We may not win, but you won't either. Good luck. Thanks a lot. Artie, 45 years old, checking himself in the mirror. Hair's turning gray. Balding. His daughter calling up. His daughter Rach. Dad, Dad, you coming down for a walk? I'll be right down, Rach. I'll be right down. Well, don't take forever, Dad. How's school, Rach? Dad, how would you like it if I said, how's business? I get it. Rach, how are things going with your friends? Well, it's only 11 o'clock and none of them have gotten up yet, so I can't say if we're in a fight or not. How are things going with you, Dad? Okay, can't complain. You know, Dad, I was over at Grandma's house the other day, and she asked me what I was going to do when I got out of school, what I was planning for college. And I said, I'm not sure yet. And she looked at me and she said, when I was your age, Rachel, I knew from what's what. Dad, do you know from what's what? <laughs> Rage. the what's what people have given up on me years ago. <laughs> but speaking of what's what, Rage, when I was your age, we used to carry a safe. We called it a safe, a contraceptive. Yeah, Dad, I know. I know what you mean. We used to carry it in our wallet. And we carried it so long in our wallet <laughs> that it x-rayed. <laughs> because we never took it out. I would guess it's the same with you, Rach, in a different way. No, it's not, Dad. <laughs> they walked home in silence. <laughs> Artie was in the back seat of his dad's car, sitting with his father. His brother, was up front with his best friend, Tony. And they were talking about an almost skirmish. They had been on uh, a local street, and the car was coming down, and they were going up, and neither car wanted to give away, and, give away, and there was going to be a big fight, you know, big riot. 
Nothing ever happened, but they were still talking about it like <laughs> it was so cool. And Artie's father turned to Artie and said, where are your friends today? How come you're out with us? What are they out, gambling as usual? How come they never go out with girls? What's going to become of them and what's going to become of you? Before Artie could answer, he said, I'll tell you, nothing. That's what's going to become of all of you. You're all a bunch of bums. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I needed that support. <laughs> now I'll go out with a lot of confidence. We need more rides like this, Dad. <laughs> Artie went up the steps where Beth, his wife of 18 years, greeted him and said, what did you and Rach talk about? I told her um, that interest rates were going up <laughs> and that we might have a hard time paying for her tuition. You told her what? <laughs> I'm only kidding. If I said interest rates, she would think I said interest dates. <laughs> Believe me, she wouldn't hear. Mostly we talked about from knowing what's what. Do you know what's what? <laughs> Adi, are you ever going to stop fighting with your brother? You'll be the death of me. You're going to kill me. You'll kill me sure, then, then God will kill me. You guys, you don't stop fighting. And tell, I'm telling you right now, Adi, you're going to work this summer. You're going to work all summer, and you're going to give me two-thirds of your allowance to pay for tuition. Do you hear me? No, no, Mom. You'll have to speak a little louder so the whole street can hear. I think the people at the top of the street didn't hear it. A real comedian. You heard me. Artie said to Rach, I'm really glad you're home from school. I could really help use your help in the office. Work is piling up on me, and if you can help me clean up a few things, it could really, really help me out. Well, Dad, I'm only home for a few days, and my sociology teacher said that I must make friends with my old friends because this is a real learning experience. So since I'll be studying really off school, I really can't help you, Dad. Not at all. No, I don't think so, Dad. I'd love to, but I have to be with my friends. That's what the teacher's assignment was. <laughs> if I see you kids fighting more one more time, I'm going to stab myself. Then you'll be happy. I'm going to stick a knife through my heart. That'll make you happy. Girls, Rach, you're her older sister. It's up to you to show her the love that I know you have in your heart. That's the most important thing I can give you. You've got to know that your mom and dad won't be here forever. And it's important. It's incredibly important for you to love each other. And that's what I leave you. In honor of my favorite rabbi, Rabbi Elman, um, he surprised me because he's seen a lot of my tapes. And he surprised me in saying that his favorite story was the story about my sister. And um, this story is, has special meaning for me tonight. My sister died about seven or eight years ago, and um, now her daughter is quite sick with MS. And um, she asked me if I would take this story and send it to her. And it's about my sister, uh, who knew she was going to die. She had cancer. And um, she wanted to have a party, because that's the way my sister was. And she wanted to have a party for all of her friends and her relatives. And she decided that the party should take place in Texas because um, that's where her two children 
were and are. And um, we all flew out there. We all flew out to Texas. And we were at the hotel, and my sister gave me the assignment of taking, I presume, either her best or one of her best friends to the place that the affair was going to be. I had never met this friend. So I was introduced to her, and she was very, I have to say, dowdy. She had a collar with a lace right up to her neck. Her dress came straight down. She had, in our business, we call them pre-death walkers, shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, you know, very demure. And um, I was a little surprised. She probably was seven or eight years older than my sister. So we got directions to how to get to this affair. And um, we were about seven minutes from the uh, hotel when inevitably we got dreadfully lost. So we pulled over to the side of the road and by serendipity uh, there was a policeman across the way. And I motioned for him to come over um, to help us uh, find this place. And uh, he did. And when he came over, he took his flashlight and he pointed the flashlight right into the car as if we had drugs and he pointed it right into our faces and he was pretty obnoxious but he did give us directions and he went back to his car and we were maybe three minutes away from him when my sister's friend whose name um, is uh, Anda, Andy, um, I'm sorry Mandy, Mandy Press said cops they're all a bunch of fuckers <laughs> I said, excuse me? <laughs> she said, you heard me. They're all a bunch of fuckers. She proceeded. She said, would you like me to tell you how your sister and I met and became friends? Well, I said... I think you met at the Concord school system and you both worked together as teachers. She said, that's what you know. Maybe if you'd shut up for a minute, you'd learn a thing or two. <laughs> that's not how we met at all. She said, your sister was a fifth grade teacher at the school and my daughter was in her class. And your sister gave her the assignment of, and the class, of course, of reading Prince and the Papa. Well, of course, everybody was going to read it. Except my daughter raised her hand and said, I'm not going to read it. Well, your sister was beside herself. She was appalled. What do you mean, she said to my daughter, Jessie. You're not going to read it? How can you not read it? You have to read it. It's an assignment. She said, I don't feel like it. And I'm not going to read it. Well, your sister was beside herself. She said, I'm going to call your mother. My daughter said, well, you just go ahead and do that. And your sister, sure enough, called me that night. Well, first of all, I hate friggin' squealers. And your sister's a squealer, because she was going to tell her my daughter. And she began by telling me that she gave an assignment to read this book, and my daughter refused to read it. So I said, big deal. She doesn't have to read that. There's lots of other books she can read. Your sister said, well, why won't she read it? I said, I don't know. Maybe she saw a review of the book <laughs> and didn't like it. Maybe she saw the movie and thought it sucked. I don't know. She doesn't want to read it. Your sister said, would you come down to the school and talk to me? I said, I will like hell. What are we going to talk about? I already told you what I thought. That's how I met your sister on the phone. <laughs> now that fall, oh, I have to tell you that the year ended in a draw. The year ended in a draw because my daughter never read the book, but it's the first time she didn't get an A. She got a B minus. Well, that fall, if the teachers all met going into the year, principal called them all together and announced that they had lost their librarian over the summer and they were going to have a new librarian. 
and her name was Mandy Press. That's me. Well, your sister almost shit a brick. <laughs> she started sputtering. Mandy Press, I had her daughter, and her daughter wouldn't read an assignment. And she's going to be our librarian. She wouldn't even come down to school to meet me. The principal, Mr. Liberal, had a big sign on the door that said, ask any question. <laughs> started, getting, started getting red in the face. The truth was he didn't like any questions at all. And he was about to really come down on your sister when the bell rang and saved your sister. Well, one day your sister came up. I guess she had assigned the same story. She came up to the library and she asked for the book. And I said, why on earth would you want that book? It's not his best work. Matter of fact, it's not even good. And your sister started laughing and saying, you're right. And we both kind of without touching, hugged each other, and we became friends. We became best friends after that. And when your sister tells, us, tells me the story about what happened with the principal, I'll tell you the truth, I almost pee my pants. But everything has ended in a draw because my daughter's now a teacher and she's never once assigned that book of Prince and the Papa. And I've never been able to teach your sister how to swear properly. <laughs> <laughs>
we were pinned to the TV watching I Love Lucy. And Desi was the fall guy. They weren't allowed to say the word pregnant when she was pregnant. They weren't allowed to say that word. Dizzy was out screwing everything he could get his hands on. <laughs> Lucy said, if I were a hater, I would hate a half of the women starlets in Hollywood, because Desi's done them all. The kids, who actually were practically born on TV, said there were two marriages. The one he saw on TV, and the madness at home. They were as dysfunctional as my family. You know, they call the 50s the silent generation. They call the 50s the nothing generation. Richard Pryor called it the great pussy drought. <laughs> I can attest to that. But it wasn't. Think about it. Think what it fested and what it fostered. Think about what was coming on the screen. Think about, I can think about, when Brando hit the screen and the men. I don't think you can have that kind of excitement today. I don't think it exists. Because we were coming from Perry Como. We were coming from love is a splendid thing. And then suddenly Brando with his leather jacket came on the screen. I don't think I can convey to anybody the meaning it had when they said, what are you rebelling against, kid? And he looked at them and he said, what do you got? <laughs> today, today he would say, what the fuck have you got? But that was then. And it wasn't just Marlon. I mean, there was Elvis. It was sexuality finally coming out in every direction. Every direction. James Dean. And they were alienated. But they were so much to us. And the alienation, we all felt that way. Because we weren't part of Ozzy and Harriet, because we thought they were perfect. And we weren't Perry Como, because we thought he was perfect. And we weren't Dean Martin. We were just a bunch of losers with our shirts hanging out. So when they came on the screen and they were alienated, God knows we could identify with them. And the things that happened in the 50s, the things that I could tell you about, the McCarthy era, do you know that his legacy today is as prominent as when he was alive? And I'll tell you why. Because what he did was he victimized people by calling them names, by calling them commies, by saying, you're not really patriotic. You tell me what Bush does that's any different. Is he doing anything different? Nope. The Republicans learned their lessons so well. They knew how to call names and scare Americans. And it works. McCarthy left a legacy. Do you know that uh, before he died, he died in 1956 of cirrhosis of the liver at 48 years old. He gave a speech on civil liberties. It wasn't published. Maybe three newspapers. And it's interesting. It's very interesting as to why it wasn't published. Because nobody gave a shit. But when he was calling people commies, it was meat to the press. It was a food frenzy. Because the people who hated McCarthy couldn't stop reading it, and the people who loved McCarthy bought papers. And it made me think, it made me think of a movie that came out uh, in that time frame. It was called Ace in the Hole, starring Kirk Douglas. And this was about a reporter who had been down on his luck. He had one time been a great reporter in New York City. And um, he started boozing and womanizing, and so his life was ruined. So all those movies had that kind of track. And he goes out to the Midwest, and this guy who owns a small newspaper decides to hire him, give him one last chance, and he doesn't have to pay him much money. So he takes him on. And there's a cave-in in a mine. And Kirk Douglas, as the reporter, does not want it to end because he's going to get the best stories. And he doesn't want these guys to get out of the cave because he's got a feeding frenzy. And it was the same thing with the reporters about McCarthy. They didn't care if one day he said, I got 200 commies in the FBI, and the next day he said, I got 60. They never reported that. What they reported was the glamour of McCarthy and the charisma of McCarthy. And then at night, they went out drinking with him. So the 50s, the 50s are an interesting time 
Because the 50s, as I said before, fested and, f and really fostered so much of what we live today. The yippies, the yuppies, the group therapies, the groups that have formed out of the 60s that really came alive in the 50s. I mean, Greenwich Village, that came alive in the 50s like no other time. I mean, you could be a homosexual in the 50s in the Greenwich Village and be accepted. You couldn't be that in the Midwest, but now you can. And then, and then, there, was, and then there was sports. Bill Russell played for the Celtics. Some of you know, some of you don't. Bill Russell was one of the greatest basketball players that ever lived, in my opinion, and the Celtic team was probably one of the most fabulous teams that was ever put together. But what was so great about the Celtics wasn't just the team, it was their announcer. Through the 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe 80s, Johnny Most. And one of the greatest things that Johnny Most ever did that I heard when I was maybe 13 or 14 is the Celtics were playing uh, the Syracuse Nationals. And there was a player on the Syracuse Nationals, uh, I, they became the Washington Nationals, and I don't know what else. Um, called the Adolph Shays. And he was at the foul line shooting a, a basketball. And he was deadly at the foul line. I think 96% of his shots went in. And Johnny Moe said, well, you gotta hand it to him. He's one hell of a shooter. But you ought to know him as a person. <laughs> I mean, who would say that today? But, back to Bill Russell. The Celtics went out to St. Louis to play what was the uh, St. Louis Hawks, it's now the Atlanta Hawks. And they got in there late and they went to their hotel and they sat down in the restaurant, they'd been hungry. And um, there were three, I think four black uh, players on the team. And um, the maitre d' came over to them and said, um, we don't serve Negroes. Well, somebody came over to the maitre d' and said, those aren't regular Negroes. <laughs> Those are basketball player Negroes. You can serve them. So they started to bring the food. Bill Russell being Bill Russell, who was an amazing character, said, we don't want your food. We're really not basketball players. That guy was lying to you. I happen to be tall, but I'm not a basketball player. So don't feed us. And they refused to play the St. Louis Hawks the next day, and they flew home. The basketball commissioner fined them. Fined them for not showing up at the game. He didn't care about this story. Can you imagine that happening today? That's some of the things that happened in the 50s that moved and moved and moved. I've told the story about Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson. I've told the story about Branch Rickey whose life was threatened every day because he took the first Negro into, into baseball. And what Jackie Robinson had to go through in order to play every day, that he had to go through on buses where he was put on the back of the bus or asked to leave the bus in, in deference to a white person. How his own teammates called him names and how he persevered and how he became one of the greatest athletes. And what's happened in baseball and what's happened in basketball because these guys had the backbone and the strength to do what they did. I think Rosa Parks was a, um, uh, uh, somebody from the 50s when she refused to move to the back of the bus. So the 50s are maligned. The 50s are called the silent generation. The 50s are called a lot of names. And I got a lot of stories about the 50s, but it's 9.30, so we'll try some other night. Magnificent. You're the best. You and your wife. Oh, she is. And you. I'm her fool. I carry out the trash. You say this so we'll love you more. <laughs> <laughs> You're not fooling us. Listen, folks, you can forget this fool called Ruth. Remember Ruth? She's my uh, Beatrice. I have to talk Italian to her. I talk, I talk a little French. <laughs> what do you want to say about your presentation? It's so uh, elegant. I like the way you mix uh, street. 
talk with a, a very uh, uh, sensitive um, awareness. I've often said, I'll say it again to you, you could get away with wearing f a formal clothes. I knew he was going to talk about the way I dress. He doesn't care what I say. <laughs> because, 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 because you're elegant. And uh, I can imagine you at the Carlisle. <coughs> How Bobby about Bobby Short? Short. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and I can, with candlelight around, you have these formal clothes, and you'd hold notice because your stuff is like fine music. It's delicate, has nuances, overlays. It's, you're, you're very patrician. A certain majesty in there. I like what you do. And people maybe have a glass, a long stem glass. You, from this, you're drinking some champagne. He doesn't care what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Now, the point He's is, got all these visions. Now, the point is, what you presented was so rare that uh, I don't know anybody doing it. And you could just imagine a club, a candle wound up. He comes out, he's got the tails, and he comes out in this cool way, and he begins to talk. And he puts a spell on the people. Because he's so, the nuances, he's, it's very poetic, he's working with nuances, nuances, and then your whole description of what is to be married. You painted, you gave us a portrait of a period, overlay, nuances, very beautifully done. I, I don't want to take it too far because it's going to embarrass you, but I thought what you did was very princely. You have a certain majesty. I could learn from you. I could, you. You could teach me some moves because I'm a rough dude. You know. Tell them about the ear. So Tell them when you cut the ear. You were so cool. <laughs> what I, what I think we Esther quotes you all the time on that. What I'd like to do now is uh, say to you, um, you brought us something magnificent. You're unique, you're cool, and you're beautiful. And what we try to do is, when someone like you comes along, we, we salute you. I salute you. And we, uh, we, don't have, we don't have words, so we, we raise our hands like this. And make all kinds of sounds. And we go, <gasps> and we say, thank you, noble sir. Thank you, noble sir. We will take this that you've given us into ourselves, and we'll travel across Europe, wrapped in many colors. But inside will be the sensibility, the poetry, the painting, and the colors you've given us. And maybe we can change the world. Maybe. Because you're so beautiful. You're beautiful. Now, what I want to do, what I want to do is suggest that next week our uh, Elsa, So what we're generally doing here, we have a little thing we do to kind of wrap it up. And we sort of we have to move a little bit. We have a dance a little bit. We want to sing. We want to give it up. Next week. Next, next week. week. At the same time. At the same, at the same time. time. Same place, it's the same, same place. place. If the good Lord will it, if the good Lord will it, and the creek don't rise, and the creek don't rise, rise. Even, if it do rise. even if it do rise, even if it do rise, we gonna do it, we gonna do it one, one more time. time.